Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we welcome all of our audience and our participants. Peter will be introducing everyone in just a minute. And I just want to remind everybody to please keep your microphones and video cameras turned off for the time being. You will be able to put questions in the chat. And um, we will be reading those questions off in a little bit. Um, I want to thank our partner, the Eastside Freedom Library. Uh, the Eastside Freedom Library and the Ramsey County Historical Society have been partners in presenting the History Revealed series of programs for over three years now, which is exciting. Um, this is a milestone for us, and we very much appreciate this partnership. We love working with them. So these programs are made possible by the members of the Eastside Freedom Library and the Ramsey County Historical Society. So please consider supporting both of our organizations. Information on membership benefits and upcoming programs are on our websites along with um, other things that are happening, exhibitions and so forth. And we're working on even more programs going forward in 2021, including continuing programs on suffrage with our exhibition on women's suffrage in Minnesota, which is on our website called Persistence, Continuing the Struggle for Suffrage and Equality, 1848 to 2020. And um, let me put up a slide and I'm going to turn it over to Peter in just a second. But again, thank you all for coming and please check out our websites, rchs.com and eastsidefreedomlibrary.org. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Robin. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, this is a great pleasure tonight in particular uh, to have our good friend Kalkalia Yang um, and a wonderful group of reader discussants um, uh, comments or questions into the chat um, or if you're watching on Facebook uh, into the comment function on Facebook and Robin and I will read questions to the panelists and to Kalia. Um, so that's the, that's the plan. Um, so uh, Kalkalia Yang uh, is a Hmong American writer. Uh, she's also a member of the founding board of the Eastside Freedom Library and a neighbor here on the east side of St. Paul. Uh, Kalia holds degrees from Carleton College and Columbia University. Um, her book, The Late Homecomer, a Hmong family memoir was a winner of the 2009 Minnesota Book Awards in Creative Nonfiction and a finalist for the Penn USA Award in Creative Nonfiction. Um, her second book, The Song Poet, uh, won the 2016 Minnesota Book Award in Creative Nonfiction and Memoir and was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award and others. Um, Kalia is uh, has turned a good part of her attention, um, besides being a mom to three kids, uh, to writing children's books. And we're very excited uh, as these children's books are coming out. Um, and we're especially excited that we're having this event tonight um, with her new book, Somewhere in the Unknown World, a Collective Refugee Memoir. Uh, responding to Kalia, uh, in, in the order in which people will speak. Uh, first will be Semukta Vongse, another East Sider. Uh, so glad to have Mooks with us. Uh, she's an award-winning Lao American poet, playwright, cultural producer, and social practice artist, and also a pretty dedicated mom. Um, she's the author of a children's book, When Everything Was Everything. Um, and she's currently the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation Playwright in Residence at Theater Mu. Um, after uh, Semukta, uh, we will hear from Sangay Taiti, uh, who is a Tibetan refugee born in India, uh, who with his family immigrated to the United States in 1998. He has been a community and labor organizer uh, involved in such projects as Students for a Free Tibet at the University of Minnesota, the Regional Tibetan Youth Congress of Minnesota, the Tibetan American Foundation of Minnesota, um, the Tibetan National Congress, and two that I've been particularly interested in, Tibetans for Black Lives, 
and as an organizer and activist within SEIU Healthcare Minnesota. Um, following Sange, uh, we will hear from uh, Ted Tar Tet. Uh, Ted Tar gets the prize for, for coming the greatest distance this evening. Um, she's exactly 12 hours away from us in Myanmar. Um, and we're just thrilled that, that she's with us. Um, she's a writer, educator, and activist. Um, she attended uh, Carleton College where she studied uh, with Kalia. Um, and she will be beginning a graduate program in writing the MFA program at Columbia University. Um, so we're, we're just so happy that Tetar is, is with us. And she looks pretty sharp for 7 a.m. Uh, Myanmar time. Um, our final respondent um, will be Najaha Muse, uh, who is a fourth year medical student pursuing a doctorate in osteopathic medicine. Um, her family fled rural Ethiopia for a refugee camp in Nairobi, Kenya, and then settled in Minnesota, where she began her formal education in the third grade. As the oldest in a family of eight children, she became the first in her family to graduate from high school and to receive a college degree. Another liberal arts college graduate uh, here in Minnesota um, from St. Olaf, right? St. Olaf Najaha, yes. Um, she's been, uh, while attending medical school, she's focused on social justice issues uh, pertaining to equity and educational access. Um, and uh, won the Vincent Hawkinson Award, which is a great recognition uh, for local activists. So we're thrilled to have all of you with us, and I'm going to turn things over to Kalia. Thank you, Peter, and thank you all of you for being here. You know, I've done, this book came out on November 10th of the last year, the old year, which feels a lot like it is actually this year, this new year that we're in. Um, but it is a pandemic book, and I've done quite a few events around this book, but I have to say I am most looking forward to this one. In some sense, I'm most nervous. Um, Sigmund Abongsai is also in this book, as well as a dear friend and, a, and an artist in our community. Tiffany, of course, was my student, and she taught me a great deal. Um, Senge and Najafa, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to meet both of you and be in conversation, um, as well as all of you. It has been incredibly, and it, it, is, it is an incredibly challenging time in America. And I think this conversation will fit right into the national dis discourse that we are and are not having. And so I'm really looking forward to being to the conversation piece of this. I think that the best way to introduce a book is to read from it simply. And so that's what I will do. I will read from this book. It's important that you all know that this book, I started working on this book in 2016 after Donald J. Trump was elected to the White House. And in many ways, it is not a coincidence that it comes out in 2020, uh, the year where he's been elected out of that same White House. And so this is from somewhere in the unknown world. It is for the refugees from everywhere, men, women, and children, whose fates have been held by the interests of nations whose rights have been contested and denied, whose thirst and hunger go unheeded and unseen. And it begins with a poem by the great American poet, Lucille Clifton, quilting. Somewhere in the unknown world, a yellow-eyed woman sits with her daughter, quilting. Some other where alchemists mumble over pots, their chemistry stirs into science, their science freezes into stone. In the unknown world, the woman threading together her need and her needle nods toward the smiling girl. Remember, this will keep us warm. How does this poem end? Do the daughters' daughters quilt? Do the alchemists practice their tables? Do the worlds continue spinning away from each other forever? And I'm gonna read today from a piece called Certificate of Humanity. It is a uh, it is, a, it is a story of a young man named Afghani who lives in these cities. He is an office worker by day and a Lyft driver in the evenings and the weekends. He is the young man, only 30 years old, and this is a part of his story. Um, 
At this point, he is in a refugee camp in Sweden. It is a five-star resort that has been converted into a refugee camp for refugees from around the world. Afghani started out um, at the age of 19, right after graduating from university. So that gives you an idea of how brilliant this young man is. Um, he's, he was working for USAID. And then the Taliban started calling him, started saying, you're wearing black, your mother is wearing white, you're in line at the grocery store, who do we shoot first? Um, Afghani was forced into a situation where, where he had to flee his country. Afghanistan. And so this is in the, this part that I would read from is in the refugee camp, the five-star resort in the mountains. The camp psychologist got to know me well. At first, she was unsure about my mental health. She was baffled by my request for a certificate of my humanity. She asked me if I believed I was human. I said, of course, but other people weren't so sure. So I needed help proving my humanity. She then offered to provide me with such proof. But why, I asked her, what is the difference between you and me? How come you are more human than me in a position to observe and certify my humanity? After all, did we not have the same blood, the same makeup, the same dreams even? Why are you more successful in your humanity than I am in mine? I told her that if she was going to give me a certificate of my humanity, she would have to show me hers first. I had to know who had given her the authority to determine human certification. I had been a human in my country, a human in a war. I told the psychologist that the war was a war on terrorism, but I was not a terrorist. I told her about the warlords, the communists, the religious thinkers, and the powerful humanitarians, all doing battle in my country. I told her that I was just a human being and that many of the human beings in my country hate war. We were victims of war, to be specific, of the Americans and the Russians and their allies and their battle for power over people. She listened to me and took notes. Finally, she said, you are not sick. She was then the first in a long time to say, thank you. Please come back to talk to me so that I can learn from you. I would not have returned to her office if it was only for her to learn from me. I was also learning from myself. I was in so much pain and my pain was so focused that I was unable to learn from myself. It took her taking the notes during our meetings and then reciting them back to me for me to know what I was saying, thinking and feeling. My dependence on the psychologist got me thinking about Sweden in a more general way. I came to understand that if I stayed in the country, I would be dependent on the government for a long time. It took eight years, eight to 10 years to get in citizenship, assuming that my appeal for asylum was accepted. I started thinking about being independent again, being the maker of my destiny, the maker of my life. I began thinking about America. And, um, and so, this is from the very end of the chapter. He's decided to come to America. He's done the paperwork and been accepted. And Afghani arrives in Minnesota in June of 2015. Gail and her husband and Deidre and her husband met me at the airport. As they drove me to their home in Minneapolis, I heard police sirens. I saw homeless people with their, ba their bags and shopping carts beside them. I saw broken concrete and uneven sidewalks. I thought. I've made a mistake. How can America go into the world and speak of humanity, of peace and prosperity, when there are so many within its own borders looking for help, when there are so many within its own borders searching for meaning, worth, a chance at a good life? In America, I work 16 to 18 hours a day. During the week, I am an office manager at a community college. After work and on the weekends, I am a Lyft driver. I live modestly in a small apartment. Every dollar that I do not need, I send to my family in Afghanistan. It brings me pride. Because of me, my family is middle class. They have food to eat. My baby brother can go to school. Because of me, they are not lost in Afghanistan. Someone in America sees them clearly and loves them completely. I have been in America for three years. I am now 29 years old. I'm engaged to a woman my mother has chosen in Afghanistan. 
I've not met her, but I know that she has a master's degree in Islamic studies. Will I be able to sponsor her and marry her here? I don't know. I don't know when a life will begin beyond this one where I work hard and take pride where I can. In this life, I've learned that Afghanistan is as much human as anyone else in this country or any other. I am as human as you are. We had this conversation at one of my favorite cafes in the Twin Cities, the Golden Time Cafe, just blocks from my daughter's school. We sat opposite each other. We laughed and we cried together. And in the end, I looked at this young man before me, his hair all white. And he looked at me and he said, are you really gonna write it down? And I said, to the very best of my ability. And I said to him, if there are any inaccuracies, I will take full responsibility. What I wanna do, what my heart wants me to do is for the world to know the brilliance of the refugees living here and living everywhere else, the strength, but also the tremendous love, love that has been lost, love that has been salvaged. That is all of our lives. I have three small children and I live in a life where they look for the superheroes in the books they read and on the television screens. But I know where the real heroes are in my life. And they are the individuals in this book. They are the individuals on this panel. And so it is a tremendous honor for me to, to be with all of you tonight and to be having this conversation at a time like this, at a time where we know history is being made. Thank you so much. And now Sigmuda, I believe you're next. Thank you, Kalia. Why is it that every time you talk, I cry? I don't know if I'm hormonal or that like you're just a very dope speaker. And um, I just wanna say thank you so much for um, reaching out and well, first making this book and telling, um, helping to tell people's stories, right? Um, do you remember when, when you reached out to me and you're like, Samukta, do you, do you know of a Lao, a Lao person, some Lao individuals that I could uh, connect with and write about and you know for them to tell their stories and I'm like uh me <laughs> and so I'm so glad that um you said yes to that but um you know my comments the, the questions that I have for you are all around like heart and like emotions and feelings um because you and I are both daughters of former refugees from the same war right? They're from this war that is known as the secret war, which was a proxy war of the Vietnam War. But it wasn't a secret for those of us who experienced it, who it impacted. So, you know, it's this undocumented war that happened. Um, and that's the thing with like so many refugee stories and immigrant stories is that it's undocumented, uh, has not been told. People, sometimes it's not part of public discourse. And so I think your book is so important because this is just giving people a piece of that world, of our world, right? And, and, and I wonder if you could answer this because like, how do you deal emotionally? Because these, these are hard stories. These are difficult stories that people are sharing with you. Like, how does your heart even deal with this? Like, I don't, I don't know. I'm like floored by it. Thank you, Sigmuda. Um, Peter, do you, would you prefer that I answer now or do we save this until after? I think it's better to, to save for after. Um, I'm going to take notes. The question. So I, yeah. Um, all so, right, thank you. Luke, you still have a little time if you wanted to, if there was more you wanted to say. I don't have more. I don't have a lot to say because I just want to hear her keep talking <laughs> <laughs> but that is that is my question to you and um you know even for me when i when i'm working on like my plays i do uh, a lot of interviews like people from the community and i have to like always stop myself sometimes i take really long breaks between having gathered some stories and then you know going and then translating translating those stories into like a script or something but and I would take these really long breaks and I just don't know how you're able to just, how your heart deals is what I'm, I'm asking. You know, it's, um, 
selfishly is like a craft question for me because I'm like, how, how, how do I use that in my work? So yeah, but I have nothing more else to say. Thank you. <laughs> Great, Sangay. Um, thank you. Um, firstly, I would like to um, thank my friend and teacher, uh, Peter, um, to the Eastside Freedom Library, Ramsey County Historical Society for this wonderful opportunity. I'm truly honored to be here. Um, I would also like to echo what Kao just said, um, in, especially in regards to politics. Um, you know, we, we all saw what went down you know, at the nation's capital yesterday. And that's going down in history, right? And, and, you know, which made me wonder and think how important this work is, right? And so, um, you know, like all refugees and immigrants who leave behind the world they've, that they've always known and make an incredible decision to settle and thrive in an environment that is completely foreign to them I too, with my family in the year 1998, partook in that experience. This is not an easy undertaking for anyone or for any family. It is not as easy as selling everything, saying goodbyes to near and dear ones, boarding a flight and settling down in a new place, supposedly a better one. Kao, as I read into your collection of powerful stories of real people and their real experiences, there were countless parallels I could draw, countless really. In the story of Irene, where she would take tiny nibbles of the banana and spend time savoring the long awaited treat, I was <laughs> reminded of my own childhood at a Tibetan refugee preschool where each day we were given two biscuits and a glass of milk. I remember slowly scraping the edges of the biscuits on my teeth, savoring its every particle. Life then in today's measure would be considered tough, but I was happy, we were happy, safe and together. In your other story, um, in our story, the heart-wrenching decision her parents had to make to separate themselves by the spread of oceans where her father would stay back with the two youngest children and her mother with the oldest three would immigrate to the United States was remedy was reminiscent of my own family's story when the United States allocated a thousand visas to Tibetan refugees back in the 1990s, the Tibetan government in exile based in India um, essentially organized a lottery where any family th that would be interested in going to America would you know, submit their names, um, names would be drawn um, and then um, and then the lucky winners essentially would be, would have the opportunity to immigrate to the United States. My family was one of them. Um, the process of immigration required that each person from, one person from each family first immigrate so as to establish a base here. Um, at the time we were young and so were my parents. And it was at that time they had made the decision to send my mother first. It was only after 15 years or so that the rest of us, my father and my sisters were able to join her. From Awo having to share a small apartment space here with her mother and sister, you know, having becoming an expert in navigating public transportation. These were details that brought much memories back to me because these were exactly my experiences here in America. In Bayan's story, where they would, in their phone calls with their father who was earning a living for them in the United States, only talk about safe things they could share. I'm reminded of countless Tibetan refugees who in their communication with family members back home in Tibet do the exact same. The Chinese government who the Human Rights Watch regards as one of the world's top abusers of human rights continues to illegally occupy my homeland, maintain tight control over the internet, mass media and academia. Authorities increasingly deploy mass surveillance systems to tighten control over society and to pre prevent any form of dissent. 
Just last month, a Chinese court sentenced a Tibetan nomad named Lundrup Dorji for a whole year for simply sharing posts that contained picture and teachings of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, the Tibetan people's leader. In Kao Ta's story, where at the end he says, I felt what the world would never see, a child seeking a way into the future and an adult looking for ways to return to the past, willing to forego everything for the experience of a simple life in a village, chicken pecking at the earth, tall trees with canopies thick enough to keep me dry from the rains. You know, now as an adult, uh, when I reflect back, um, I too feel like I belong in that same exact boat. Although in a refugee camp, Life really was much simple back then. We were happy and we were carefree. And so finally, you know, with the rise of right-wing politics and the election of populist leaders in many parts of the world, where systematic racism that has always existed has now bolstered and enabled those subscribing to fascist and supremacist ideologies to openly advance their selfishness I find that your work, a telling of refugee stories, serves as one of the most important of tools to dismantle them. The world needs to hear these stories. These stories need to be told. And people, especially those privileged, advantaged, and therefore in power, need to absolutely hear them. Because I strongly believe in this simple idea advocated strongly by my leader, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, that human problems must be solved by taking a human approach. And that human approach should be to develop compassion and understanding for others. And that can only be accomplished when we begin to accept that we are all the same human being who desire happiness and end to suffering. Thank you so much again. Thank you, Sangay. Beautiful. Thank you. Tatar, you're next. Thank you. Minglava, um, everyone. Um, again, my name is Tatar Thet. Uh, first, I would like to extend uh, my gratitude to Kalia Yang, who, as I was mentioned earlier, was my you know, teacher while I was at Carleton, who saw a very lonely Burmese student and told her she had potential and she is the reason why I became a writer now that I'm here. Um, so I have a lot of to be grateful for to be able to be virtually side by side with her right now as well as with the East Side Freedom Library who also when I graduated from Carleton carved out a space for me to feel at home um, and to feel my authentic self. So I'm very grateful to be a part of this event. Um, and, you know, I think my narrative, um, my narrative personally has always been quite different as an immigrant, as someone who uh, is the product of uh, Burmese parents who left the country very early on um, to seek greener pastures in a sense. And I was very then as a result, disconnected from my own home country, from my own home culture. Um, and I think the past 25 years of my life have been a process of trying to make sense of the pieces of me that are here, to deconstruct the pieces that were built as a result of being born abroad, being raised abroad, and then being suddenly told at 12 that we were going back to Myanmar because we had no other options. Um, and so that process of deconstruction and reconstruction, this idea of uh, the pieces of ourself, what is left behind, what is brought with us, uh, what has to be forgotten, what can't be forgotten as we navigate this world, um, was a lot of what struck me as I was reading these narratives and these powerful stories. Um, and it really amazed me in a sense, the ways that we color stories with the pieces of ourselves, uh, you know, what tugged at my heartstrings because of the pieces that were in me that I didn't even realize <laughs> uh, were being impacted by stories that weren't even from cultures and continents that I had any knowledge of. 
uh, from generations that, you know, were there before I was even born. And yet they tugged at my heartstrings in ways that I wasn't expecting. Um, and also being Karan as well, I have to uh, make a special highlight for the narrative leaving with no goodbyes, which I think is so indicative of the way my people operate as well, of that sense of loss and that sense of trying to, again, find the pieces of ourself and pick it back up and reconstruct ourselves and our new identities. Um, some quotes that I found in particularly very uh, poignant for me, you know, life is too valuable to face with fear. Uh, or I did not learn how to prepare my body for the impact of the unforgiving ground. I found versions of myself. I thought about how her disappearance would not be a big deal, but mama's would be. You know, these are lines that will, I think, stick with me far beyond the, just the reading of this book when I received this book in December. Um, you know, so what I think when I want to sum up my thoughts on the, um, how this book struck me, I think about, you know, what do our memories do for us? Um, how do we transform our memories and do our memories in a sense become our enemies as well as we try and remember what happened to us, uh, remember our past as we try and make sense of our presence and futures. Uh, and in particular, you know, I think of my people and how oral history is so important to us. It is what has kept our culture alive. Um, our sense of togetherness alive has always been about oral history um, and to now see part of that history in written form um, in a language that uh, in English, you know, in English, which is a language of our oppressors in a sense. And what does that mean for us moving forward as we think about archiving our inheritance and archiving our collective history? Because um, I think, again, as I was saying before, despite these continental and generational differences, there's such a common through line between these narratives of the sense of trying to rediscover ourselves and rediscover our past. And so um, I think those are my, my collective thoughts on this book. And again, thank you so much for writing it and bringing these people to the spotlight. Um, and I know how as much as it tugged my heartstrings, I'm sure it will tug many, many more in the future. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Tatar. Um, Najaha, please. Uh, <clears throat> hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much, Peter, for this invitation. Um, and thank you so much, Kalkalia Yang, for this wonderful book um, that really uh, is chilling, um, tells the narratives of refugees, um, their plight um, and the resilience of the human spirit. Um, while like Sam um, uh, that said, uh, I had to take several breaks in between these stories because um, it's so vivid um, and it really, for me personally, it speaks to my experience as a refugee um, coming from uh, rural Ethiopia uh, during a time of war um, and just the passage between leaving one's own country and sort of transitioning into the next, that, you know, that middle ground is really where a lot of the trauma happens and you capture that really well. Um, and I, like you said, I think I appreciate the perspective of reading these stories as a form of uh, not only instruction for, for adults, but for, for children as well to see how the human spirit is like very much capable of overcoming some of these obstacles um, and uh, just is inspirational, um, you know, looking at our personhood, our um, uh, our belonging and our sense of place um, and how home is, you know, can be anywhere you go. Um, it depends on where you find that love, that sense of belonging with the community that you create. Um, and so um, I really just appreciate all of you being able to speak on those experiences and uh, 
uh, like Tatar said, I think uh, reconstructing our narrative as, as refugees, as products of immigrants is really, really important for the future, especially with the um, uh, political climate today. Um, and these stories are gonna serve as a means to share with the world what our humanity is and how we are here to, you know, live but at the same time uh many of us have uh altruistic you know altruistic uh values our cultures are very altruistic um and coming to america was a means for us to help not only our own families but our communities back home um and we do that by opening up our, our own homes our communities to the people who are who may be very well different from us or who share a different background um so i just there's there's so many great um, excerpts from the book. I can't really pick just one, but it was such a pleasure to read the book. Um, I uh, related to it very much, um, and just really appreciate um, this opportunity to converse with Kaukulia Yang and all of the panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all of you for your for your words. I think I. You know, I carried this book inside of me for, for four years. But this was a book that readers have asked for the moment I became a writer. I remember um, doing my first real reading. It was at a UN conference and there was a refugee from Eastern Europe and another from Africa and both got up and they said, that's my story too. This is the late homecomer. And then in the in the years after, wherever I spoke, if there were if there were other refugees in the room, they'd come up and they'd say, I felt what you felt. I know what it is like to be in that moment. And there were some who asked if I would write their stories too. But I wasn't ready. It took me 12 years to feel that I could perhaps do it justice. You know, one of the biggest comments that I get from readers is or is that I'm perhaps writing for people who can't write for themselves? And this makes me laugh a little because I come from the best storytellers that I've ever met. It makes me laugh because in this very collection is Sigmuda's story, a phenomenal writer, you know, a phenomenal, phenomenally funny and thoughtful and emotional and brave writer, you know? And, and the reality is, Sheikh Muda will write her story in many, many ways, but I think she understood and I understood from the very beginning that, that the portraiture I would draw would be a gift and that I, I offered it as such. That this book is a, is a contribution first to the individuals whose stories are in it, but to all of these different communities and to this, this population that we are all part of, this population of refugees, the stateless in some sense, no matter how far we travel, no matter how far we return to the places where we were born, the places where we were made. Um, I think I'll start the Q&A by tackling Sigmuda's very good question about heart. You know, how, how does this heart deal? I'm not afraid to cry for others. In fact, I believe as my father, as my mother, as my grandmother did, that our tears and our words are our most sincere gifts to each other. And so in all of these tellings, there were tears and there were tears are parts of the stories that never made it into the book. And there were tears for the parts of the stories that are, that are in the book. Tears are not sad. I think they are a reckoning. I think they're a realization. I think they're a seeing. And so my heart was soaked with tears for four long years. Much of it had to do with the despot in the White House and all of the policy and the changes that were being made to refugee lives everywhere within the country and internationally. But much of it was also because I think I live, you know, my, I have a brother who loves me dearly and he's always telling me, let it roll down your back, let it roll down your back. Nothing rolls down my back. You know, everything finds a space and a place in my heart. In Hmong, we have a saying, the house may be little, but the heart is vast. I carry it in my heart because the heart is vast. 
you know, memories to me, and this is um, with Tatara's question, you know, memories to me are never the enemies. They've always been my friends. I'm not afraid, even when it hurts, because they remind me that somehow we are still here. They remind me that I can still cry, not only for my own story, but for those of other people. There is a difference when you cross that line in each of our experiences, you know, and here I'll talk about miscarriage. I had, my mother has seven miscarriages. She has seven living children. Somewhere along in my childhood, she attempted to visit the other side because she missed, she yearned for them, so their possibility. I've always known that miscarriages happen in the lives of many women, and yet it was a story that I never wanted to live. But of course, it was a story that I would live, and that I would, I would live through, and I would live to tell. And at first, I cried a lot for myself. And then the tears stopped, and the words came in their place. But when I started collecting, with, along with Shannon Gibney, this collection, What God Has Honored Here, we were both crying and we were crying for each other and we were crying for women we've never met, stories we've never known. And something had changed in the process. And that is what happened in the course of four years. When I was a little girl, I used to read books about people, brave writers who stood up in opposition to the tyrannies of their time, the tyrannical leaders, the despots. And I, I used to wonder, how do they do it? Why? What, how? In the last four years, I realized I was becoming that kind of writer and that it was this book. That I was making a stand in opposition to the policies of my country. And I knew I wasn't alone because you all are here with me because those 14 individuals were in my life. And so that's where the power comes from. That's where the heart finds the space to hope so much, so much, so much we can hope, even today, even this moment right here, right now, so much hope for what we will do individually and what we will do together. Thank you. I, I wanna suggest that we all just take a breath. Uh, <laughs> I know I need to, um, let's just take a breath. And Robin, after we've breathed, do you want to read the first question, please? Sure, I'll do that. First of all, I want to thank everybody for sharing um, your words and your experiences. Um, this has been a very moving experience. Of course, all of us have immigrants in our backgrounds, but to hear from people whose experience is so close and is so um, immediate has been extremely moving for me as well as um, all of our audience members, I believe. So we have a question um, that I'll read out. It's rather a long question, but it's a good question. Um, the person in the audience says, I want to start creative writing and write books one day to serve as the documentation and evidence of my existence and of my communities and families, but I have not built the courage yet because as a Hmong woman, it has continued to be challenging because of cultural barriers and often being told to keep your stories and advocacy to yourself in the Hmong community. What piece of advice can you offer me to help fight these barriers to become the storyteller that I aspire to be so I'm not left feeling ashamed or guilty after sharing my creative writings and my struggles in this America to society. And I believe that would um, apply to many people. That is a wonderful question. And I'm gonna answer this way because I know the Sikh Muda will answer an entirely different way as well as all of you. Um, I think that sometimes when we're starting out, we are angry at ourselves. Why can't we be brave enough? Why can't we be ready? The days are passing, the weeks are passing the months and the years are coming and we're so keenly aware of this. And I really wanna say, take a deep breath, what Peter just told all of us. I really wanna say that all of the things written and unwritten, that these things are the making of who you are and the life that you will live. And sometimes finding grace for ourselves is the hardest thing to do. 
but it's important to recognize that important work is being done at this time in this space. You know, people say sometimes to me, why do you talk like you're writing? How much of what I've written has never been published and will never be? How much of what I speak first came to me on some lonely night somewhere when I was unsure? So often when I speak, and the same is true when I write, I say the things that I've lived my whole life waiting to hear from someone somewhere. People can teach you your patterns as a writer. People can teach you the parts of your writing that is powerful, that is striking, and that, it, that isn't, you know, pacing, things like that. But the heart of a writer cannot be taught. It is first tried and tested in the world that we live, in the lives that we inhabit, by the forces that govern who we are. And I want to urge you to pay close attention to this time. The things that you write do not have to be pretty. They do not have to be for anyone. First and foremost, writing must be a gift to its writer. That's the only way this process sustains itself. It is even in the thought of public publication, really. It is this process where you know that in the writing, you are meeting parts of yourself that has never, never made itself known to you before. That you're meeting the world and that you're punching back as hard as it is punching you. And so I really want to say, be kind to yourself at this time. And, and, and give yourself the time you need. Because once, once the journey begins, you're not quite in control of it anymore. At this point in time, you are though. You're in charge of what you put down and what you don't. You're in charge of the questions you ask yourself and maybe the answers that you stumble upon as well. And then I'll let the rest of my panelists um, speak to the same question because I think it's so important. Yeah, I can, I can go ahead and um, speak from my own experience. Uh, you know, I'm not, um, I haven't written a book yet. <laughs> I hope that is in my future. Um, I'll, I'll give you, I'll, I'll kind of split my answer in this way with both the practical and the emotional side of me. So I'll start with the practical. Uh, insofar as Minnesota, has a breadth of resources in regards to writing, especially for new writers. Um, you know, when I graduated Carleton, I was so concerned because, you know, Carleton was like college was the first place I had ever taken a creative writing class in my life. I had never like experienced that ever before. And that magic that I had while I was there of being able to write about myself and write about my family and write about my people and heal by doing so, I thought I would never have that again. And the Twin Cities told me very differently. Um, there's places like the Loft Literary Center in Minneapolis in which you can take writing courses and be amongst like-minded people who are also you know, new fresh writers who, and I think the important thing that you mentioned in the question as well is that you want to start. And that is um, so important, the, the desire to start, the desire to want to put words on a page and you're going to find so many people at spaces like the loft at spaces like subtext at a bookstore in which you know I did a reading even though I had no clout to my name my writing resume was <laughs> barely a sentence and yet they gave me the opportunity to do a reading there um east side freedom library the same thing you know I again barely had one <laughs> one line of a writing resume it's artist bio to my name and they gave me the opportunity and so there's so many of those resources spaces that you can do and i think in regards to the courage piece uh, you know i think as as a writer for me i always feel like my brain is trying to catch up to my heart you know my heart is always working at a faster pace than my brain is and so sometimes that disconnect can lead me to a stalemate of not uh, of doubt of insecurity of not knowing if my words are good enough if they're going to serve anybody um, um, and and those real societal barriers of you know the current community is incredibly insular and there's always this concern that if we reveal ourselves too much we we open ourselves to criticism we open ourselves to pain and uh Ret uh, retreading old wounds that we had tried so hard to cover up. Um, but I think all the more important for you to be open and honest about that. 
you know, all the more important for you to free yourself and your people and your community through your work and through your words. And again, it doesn't have to be the biggest project to start. It could be a one page piece of work and that piece of work can be the most important piece of work that you ever do or that anyone will ever read. And there will be someone out there who will resonate with what you're doing and you will find your community um, of writers who will encourage you and be there for you. And again, the, the important thing is always just to start. Um, and you have the, the the greatness of, and this is what I miss about Minnesota, you have the greatness of being in Twin Cities that will embrace you for that, so. Um, just, oh, yes, I'd like to share um, that sometimes you just have to take yourself out of spaces that don't serve you. And you have to create spaces for yourself that will empower you. Um, and whatever you choose to write, you know, make sure that what you put down and what you share with the world is stuff that's going to make you feel empowered. Um, my joke in my family is that, you know what, you guys don't come to my readings or read my stuff anyways. Like they buy my stuff, like they'll buy a chapbook or a children's book sometimes. And um, they don't even read it. They don't even open it. They just want to show support by just like buying it, which is cool. I like their money. I'll take it. Um, but the freedom with that is that I can write whatever I want and my family won't, they won't be ashamed because they didn't read it. So um, that's one way to look at it. And uh, definitely, yes, Minnesota has tons of resources, right? One of the great things about our state is that um, we have the legacy amendments and, you know, there's so much funding out there, especially for new and emerging writers. And so you just gotta you just gotta find um, just just Google grants for writers in Minnesota. Um, what else was I gonna say? Yeah, start small. Sometimes it's like those snippets of writing that could really be powerful for you. Um, and send it out into the world. Send it out to oh yes, professionally stalk your favorite writers. Like stalk their resumes and CVs. Like don't stalk them at their houses. You know, but like. Like look at look at their resumes and see where they've been published, right? And see if if maybe those places would want your work to live there too. So so start there and just keep writing and keep telling your stories however you want. Who cares? <laughs> the Jaha and anything you want to add? Um, you know, that's really hard to follow. All the panelists have done a great job of just giving really practical um, advice on how to go about that. But for me, um, I, I'm not a writer by training. I'm a medical student, um, soon to be doctor this spring. Um, but I think what, if I think about writing or creative writing, one of the things that can sometimes be a barrier is thinking about everything like objectively or like um, from another person's perspective and how they can judge your work. Um, and so in order to kind of get past that, you have to, like uh, Kauklia said, think of the, your writing or your um, piece as a, as a gift to yourself and something that you're going to be proud of to like share with the world. Um, because then um, you're not, you know, necessarily judging yourself so harshly that you can't get past that first barrier, which is the initiative to start writing uh, and reflecting on your experience um, and your narrative. Uh, so yeah, I would just um, uh, follow uh, what everyone has said and just say, uh, go ahead and start, start somewhere, start small and obviously um, put yourself in spaces that are gonna give you resources um, and, uh, you know, remove yourself from situations that don't add to that journey. Um, in becoming the writer that you want to be. Thank you. <clears throat> Sange, I know you don't, may not think of yourself as a writer, but I do think of you as a powerful communicator. Um, would you say a little bit, and I think you operate in a diaspora in ways that few people I know do, so that you're putting things in Tibetan and people in other countries are, are reading what you're making available. Um, Want to say a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, especially, you know, I could, I was thinking if, you know, perhaps I could speak on the, you know, finding the courage ex aspect, right? You know, as uh, Peter said, I'm not a writer. I do enjoy uh, reading, 
Um, but, you know, um, being an, a community organizer and an activist for a number of years, um, and the way I found the courage was, you know, essentially in um, being on the ground, organizing, being with the people, right? Um, you know, some examples perhaps that I could share was, um, you know, um, oftentimes we would organize, uh, you know, protests against the Chinese gov government, um, you know, um, and take a bus, you know, uh, and organize bus rides to uh, Chicago, you know, uh, at the Chinese consulate uh, to New York, um, you know, a 24 hour bus journey, right? Um, and, you know, and those were moments where I've, you know, met incredible uh, people, uh, my people, and I've heard some of the most, you know, heartfelt stories. And it was in those venues, you know, sitting alongside somebody in the, in the bus, sharing a seat, um, you know, uh, sharing a meal at the rest stop. Um, so, so my advice is, you know, from an organizing standpoint is to, you know, uh, find time in, you know, in joining, a you know, organizations, NGOs, um, you know, in your communities, um, you know, um, volunteer in them. Um, and, and that's, you know, where you may, you know, upon, you know, um, um, knowing a lot of people uh, coming to know about, you know, their history, find that courage, uh, just as I have. Thank you. Um, do we have other questions out there? Everyone's still just breathing. Let's, let's, are there other questions? Uh, there's a comment um, Good. from an audience member that mentioned that I wish white European people would investigate the history of their families and understand how they came to the place they now inhabit. For many of them, they find much in common with these brothers and sisters. And this person mentions, as I wrote up our history, it's refugees all. And I think that's something we can all relate to. But please feel free to put a question in the um, chat before I let everybody respond to that comment. And if you um, would like to keep it anonymous or private, um, feel free to send it to Peter or myself. I'm so happy to respond to any questions from the panelists. I know that. Um, this conversation could probably continue for a whole other hour because there's so much to talk about. But if any of you have any particulars, I'm, I'm happy to, to explore as well. I do have one question. Um, you know, reading the, the stories, I, I felt um, at the, towards the end, I always felt like, gosh, like there's more to the story. Like where's the, where's the closure um, for, for especially some of the earlier stories? I felt like, I needed that, I needed their narrative to find, find peace and like find um, success, quote unquote, right? Because we are always looking for that, um, that ending in a movie. Um, but towards the end, I, towards the end of the book, I felt like maybe there is no closure because that's exactly where you were inserted into their life and where you, you, you captured that story. So can you, can you sort of uh, touch on, you know, what your thought process was in writing them and did you feel a sense of like gosh like I, I can write more on this and find some closure for these for these um protagonists Najaha that's such a good question you know the reality is that each of these individuals could have many many books written of their lives alone you know um when you talk about refugee narratives mostly people think about reportage or or more traditionally um, you have as told two narratives. And that's not what this says. There's speeds, I mean, for all of you, I think very much like a book of short stories. And so that, that was that was one of my literary goals. I wanted to I wanted to present to the world a collection not only about how we got to America, but but about our human, our, our deeply and important stories. I asked each individual, tell me the stories, the story of your life, essentially tell me the stories of your life. And sometimes there were three, four, five, six, you know? And then in the end, it was, it was up to me to decide which stories to focus on and really how to tell, how to tell each narrative. The book ends with Tommy Sar's story. Tommy is a dear friend um, of mine. And I, 
And it was so important because Tommy is born in America. Tommy is the child of Cambodian refugees, survivors of Pol, Pol Pot. The traumas of that war live in his parents. Tommy has muscular dystrophy. And as a child, he was sent to California for what he thought was a vacation, which ended up being 10 whole years away from his family. And what it was so important for me to write, and I think this responds beautifully to the comment as well, that in America, we can make our own refugees and more often than not, we do. That was such an important thing. You know, it isn't until, so I begin with, a, you know, other people's children to mirror the process of getting to know someone. And it ends with a letter to my own children. All of a sudden, we've traveled all this way. You know, you find out that these people are people here in the Twin Cities who are part of my life. Call children and my children go to the same school. You know, um, there, there, there are all of these connections and points of connections. And that, I think, was a driving force. The one, Emotionally, there were things I wanted to, I wanted to capture the highs and the lows of the human experience. You know, you begin with children refugees and then you get to refugee elders. And then all of a sudden you end up to these, these kids who will never even know that they are the descendants of refugees unless, unless they read this book, unless we tell them the stories, unless they, they go into the world and they find their origin stories in so many ways as Americans. And so less important than closure, I wanted to open it was in that way I returned to all of the beginnings of my youth. When I became a writer, the hardest thing was finding where to end a story because stories continue. Stories continue, right? Um, and, and with this particular book, I wanted to take you to 14, 15, 16, 17, infinite numbers of beginnings. I wanted you to feel the beginnings. I wanted you to feel the beginnings even when we're at the end. For example, sisters on the other side of the river, right? We have um, we have Fong's story where there are these two sisters that he's locked on the other side of the Mekong River. He's raising two daughters. Now as an old man, he feels, he feels them coming closer. He feels himself returning to that river, that there will be a meeting. And he'd asked me to write the story. That was my very first story in this whole collection. He asked me to write the story so that when his time comes, when he meets those two sisters again on the edge of that river, he can tell them that he's sorry he couldn't have been the man that they were waiting for. And yet it isn't the beginning of the book. It isn't quite the end of the book. It's near the later half of the book, but there are all of these considerations for me. Um, satisfaction is the last thing that I wanted to offer because there is no satisfaction in the refugee life. You live in one country, you dream of another. You imagine a better place where you are. And for so many of us, we work toward that endlessly, exhaustively, we work toward that. So satisfaction, not interested in it in my work, actually. Very few of my books are satisfying and some of them will never be popular. And, I, and I'm, I'm big enough for that. I'm 40 years old. I've been at this since I was 22 years old, you know, in this writing life. I know that not all of my books will be popular and that is okay with me. I'm writing it for the people who need it the most. I'm writing it for this heart that yearns to see these kinds of books in the world. And I know that we're already eight minutes over the time and I wanna be respectful of your evening. So um, I really wanna say thank you all for being a part of this conversation, for taking the time out of this historic moment to make a little bit of history at the Eastside Freedom Library and with the Ramsey County Historical Society. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kalia, Sange, Tatar, Najaha, Semukta. Thank you, everyone who's come. <clears throat> I want to especially thank my colleague, Carla Reilly, for her work uh, to make the technology work. It's still kind of magical uh, to me. And, and to thank Robin and her colleagues at the Ramsey County Historical Society. Um, this book and other books by Kalia are available uh, at Subtext Books, uh, an independent bookstore in downtown St. Paul. Uh, we want to keep these independent bookstores alive. Um, urge you to pick up uh, Kalia's children's books, which are really special. Um, 
and just thank everybody for being part of this conversation uh, tonight. Robin, anything you want to add? No, again, I want to thank everybody for being open and sharing your experiences and your wisdom and your heart. Um, it was a wonderful program. And we so appreciate you joining us tonight. And to all the audience, thank you. And just a little bit of a plug to check out our websites again for upcoming programs. We have more wonderful programs coming up. And to wish everybody a very happy, healthy, and improved 2021. <laughs>